Tonight on Huckabee, Baghdad under siege as insurgents sweep across Iraq and surge toward the capital. It's not like we haven't seen this problem coming for over a year. And what's the president doing? Taking a nap. The commander-in-chief weighs his options. Any action that we may take to provide assistance to Iraqi security forces has to be joined by a serious and sincere effort by Iraq's leaders. We can't do it for them. Less than three years after pulling out, can the U.S. stop Iraq from falling to Islamic militants? And Conservatives are afraid that uh, the Republican establishment has left them behind. Kansas Congressman Tim Hulescamp on the message Eric Cantor's defeat sends to the GOP. Plus, Sergeant Bo Bergdahl back in the U.S. Armed Forces Committee Chair Buck McKeon reacts tonight. Welcome to Huckabee. This week we're coming to you from the Los Angeles Fox News Bureau. Well, Eric Cantor gets shown the door and no one saw it coming. The House Majority Leader made history by being the first person in America who held that position to be defeated in a primary. Now, if the postmortems from the pundit class are so brilliant and accurate, then why didn't they have a clue before the fact? Explanations have run all over the map for Cantor's stunning defeat. The Tea Party influence, Cantor's support for immigration reform, his being better connected to the Washington crowd than to his district, and his overconfidence in his raising $22 for every dollar that David Bratt, his opponent, had. Now, all of those issues were certainly a factor. But I don't think the winning candidate, David Bratt, has been given enough credit. Fact is, Brett, the Randolph-Macon economics professor, just happens to be a very articulate and common-sense candidate. It wasn't all about what Cantor did wrong. It was also about what Brett did right. He connected with people about free markets, and he spoke about making sure that laws applied to the big boys on Wall Street, who not only were too big to fail, but were too big to jail. Now, if the average American worker struggling to put food on his family's table on an hourly wage had gamed the system like some of the Ivy League leeches who bled their companies dry, they'd go to jail. And Brad had the audacity to suggest that they should. Eric Cantor spent more campaign money on steakhouses than Brad did in his entire campaign. And that looked about as out of touch as Hillary whining last week that she and Bill were struggling to pay all those pesky taxes on a measly $10 million of book income. Not to mention the paltry $200,000 per speech that Bill was getting. Well, here's what folks in the Wall Street to Washington corridor of power still don't get. People in the real world are struggling. They're not opposed to immigration because they're racist. They're opposed to their government creating dumb, job-killing regulations and then importing competition for the few jobs that are even available. If Mexico won't let one Marine loose from its torturous prisons, then a lot of Americans, well, they're just not too keen on Mexico sending several million of their folks over the border. If tax-paying American citizens have to present a photo ID and be electronically strip-searched and felt up by federal hands, just to board a plane from Dallas to San Antonio, then they don't want people to be able to get jobs without at least, well, maybe stopping by the border and passing a little background check. Americans aren't mean, not at all. We're the most generous, we're the most tolerant, and the welcoming people on earth. If you don't believe that, then try to cross the border the other way into Mexico and demand that you want your instructions in English when you press to, that you want free food, free health care and education, and that you want to continue celebrating the 4th of July, and that you expect the government to let you vote in Mexico. Americans aren't mad that people want to come here. We get on our knees every night, and thank God we live in a country that people are trying to break into, rather than one they're trying to break out of. But if our own government is going to secure jobs for people here illegally before they first help secure jobs for American citizens? then Eric Cantor won't be the last to go. Well, more on what Cantor's defeat may mean for the GOP a little later in the show. But first, Iraq is on the brink of civil war. 
Just over two years after President Obama withdrew the U.S. troops from the country, Islamic militants have taken over major cities in the north and west, including Fallujah and Ramadi. They're now marching toward Baghdad. On Saturday, Iran's president said his country is ready to help Iraq if asked. That's as hundreds of young Iraqi men volunteered to join the fight against the terror group. But on Friday, President Obama said he won't commit to helping an Iraqi government which has not been able to resolve sectarian differences to defend itself. Frustrated Iraq war veterans who fought so hard to secure Iraq's freedom are calling the latest developments a real punch in the gut. My first guest served in Operation Iraqi Freedom. He lived in Tikrit, one of the cities that has now fallen back into enemy hands. He also commanded the task force unit that was key in the hunt and capture of Saddam Hussein. That story is told in his book, We Got Him. Lieutenant Colonel Steve Russell joins me now. Colonel, great to have you back on the show. I want to just mention that uh, one of the people reviewing your book made this comment. I thought it was uh, rather brilliant. He said of it, he said that it is a treasure for war, colleges, uh, cl war college classes yet unborn that your book told how it ought to be done. You were there. You and those who served with you shed blood in order to get Saddam Hussein and to secure Iraq's freedom. I want to get a personal reaction. As you watch these events unfold, how does it hit you? It's, it's heartbreaking. Um, I've corresponded with a few of my Iraqi friends in Tikrit, uh, worried about their families. Uh, Soldiers, we've all uh, been piping up on the social media, talking to each other about we've got some vacation time. Maybe we ought to go over there and straighten it out. It's it's very very uh, it's hard to describe because it's so preventable, Governor. Well, I, let's talk about that because how could we not have seen this coming? I mean, I just ask myself, with the extraordinary resources that our country has in intelligence, both on the ground and overseas and in the air. How could we not have seen something brewing before it came to this level? Well, I think one of the problems that we've seen is that we have uh, ignored history. After every conflict resolution, certainly in the last 125 years, we've had some type of agreement, status of forces, we've left a, a uh, contingency of troops behind that planted an American flag so that it says if you're going to pick on little brother you get big brother who's right there with him and instead uh, we opted to take the political route and we ignored good policy regardless of what administration was in charge and without a status of forces agreement without an American presence now we signaled to our enemies that they can fill the void and it looks like they have was this an intelligence failure or was this a strategic failure? I think it's a combination of both. Uh, what we've seen is that with the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, uh, they have been squeezed out of certain portions of Syria. Uh, they're moving on the old Ba'athist networks. Of course, Syria's regime is Ba'athist. Saddam's regime was Ba'athist. Uh, they're trying to unite Sunni Arabs into this uh, twisted Islamic State. And that's unfair to Sunni Arabs because they are largely in Iraq secularist. They don't want uh, a radical government in charge. And so they're really caught in between. Uh, they have a Shia-led government that will not power share uh, with them. Uh, they are squeezed on both ends and they, they really have no recourse. And now they see their American allies that uh, had tried to convince them and said, look, if you'll, if you'll join the, the surge and you'll have the Sons of Iraq movement and you put this thing together, we will uh, secure all of this, hand over a great government, and you'll be in good shape moving forward. They did that. And then this president, in trying to get us uh, to end the war in Iraq, instead, Governor, it looks like he is ending Iraq. You know, that's a powerful statement, ending Iraq rather than just the war. And it looks like that it well could be on the brink of, of just utter annihilation with forces fighting each other. Iran, for heaven's sake, stepping in to say they're going to try to fix it. Let me ask this because, you know, I wonder, is the president listening to anybody in the military? Does he listen to anybody at the Pentagon? And if he's not, if you could whisper in his ear as he comes out to California this weekend to play golf at Palm Springs, I'm just wondering, what would you say to the president as to, Mr. President, here's what we need to be doing in Iraq to get this situation under control? 
There's, there's two things that need to be done. And first, he did not listen to the Department of Defense officials. He did not listen to the service chiefs and the combatant commanders in 2011 and 12. They warned him that this would happen. It's fully on the record. in to say they're going to try to fix it. Let me ask this because, you know, I wonder, is the president listening to anybody in the military? Does he listen to anybody at the Pentagon? And if he's not, if you could whisper in his ear as he comes out to California this weekend to play golf at Palm Springs, I'm just wondering, what would you say to the president as to, Mr. President, here's what we need to be doing in Iraq to get this situation under control? There's, there's two things that need to be done. And first, he did not listen to the Department of Defense officials. He did not listen to the service chiefs and the combatant commanders in 2011 and 12. They warned him that this would happen. It's fully on the record. But it's not uh, irreversible. In fact, there's two courses of action that need to be taken in parallel. One, Prime Minister Maliki needs to reach out uh, to the Kurds. He needs to reach out to the Sunni Arabs uh, in the north. They're still largely very, very tribal. And he needs to tell them, look, we all agree we don't want a jihadist Islamic state. So how about we join together? Let's get things back in order and I will power share. You'll have key uh, posts in cabinet, uh, in parliament. You'll have leadership uh, positions proportionate to your population. Uh, these are the types of things that will unite Iraqis because they'll see a vision for the future. Uh, Maliki, he decided that he would not do any of this um, after he re-secured his election this past spring and now we, we see the situation that we have. The president, on the other hand, he needs to provide resources. He needs to show some strength. He needs to uh, provide whatever it is intelligence-wise, uh, drone-wise, aircraft-wise, and even if it's a contingent, uh, to go and show that we will not let this investment go. Uh, those are all things that should be on the table and we should be moving on very, very quickly. It's not irreversible, but it's sending a, a terrible message to our allies around the world that if you are in trouble, whether you're in Ukraine or Iraq, the United States is disengaged and will not help you. What a sad message. Colonel, thank you very much for uh, being here. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Coming up, California Congressman Buck McKeon. I'm going to get his reaction to what's going on in Iraq and to POW Bo Bergdahl's return to the United States. That's coming up next. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show and share with me your thoughts, I welcome your response. Go to my website, MikeHuckabee.com. You can connect with me on Facebook, sign up to follow my regular messages on Twitter, or leave comments on the feedback section at MikeHuckabee.com.